My name is Jackie Aiken, and I had the pleasure of working with and training with uh, Dr. Marlene Rankel. And Marlene and I were on the board of directors of the Rape Trauma Center of Edmonton in 1978 together. So we're talking a long time. And I was privileged in having Marlene come to Grand Prairie and train my therapist um, while I was running a sexual assault and trauma center in Grand Prairie. And she was our first clinical supervisor. And I would love to share what she has taught us and what we use in working with trauma. And uh, our second clinical supervisor was Dr. Klaus Halschmidt, who had also worked with Marlene, but his, his history was coming out of working with offenders for many, many years. So he had 17 years of working with offenders out of Alberta Hospital. Uh, and so we've taken Dombrowski's material and we've applied it to working with offenders and victims of abuse. And what's so important now is I think the implications of early childhood trauma have finally been well documented. And although women's shelters, sexual assault centers, um, there's been leading work done in Canada on domestic violence and a sexual assault for years. The Adverse Childhood Experience Study done in 1998, I think has now proven to us that we need to be dealing with domestic violence or we're going to be picking up pieces of mental illness and physical illness. We can't prevent either mental or physical illnesses without dealing with domestic violence and early childhood trauma. Um, so when we look back at the whole history of, of trauma unfolding, we had rape trauma syndrome uh, identified within the sexual assault community in the early 70s. So that would be one of the first things that Marlene never taught me was that material. At that same time, uh, the trauma to caregivers was being identified by Mitchell, and that was to frontline caregivers dealing. And we had them into Alberta in the early 70s, no, early 80s, when there was a tornado out of Edmonton and Mitchell came in and taught us critical incident stress debriefing protocols, which are now modified. Um, I ran the first, uh, the third women's shelter to open in Grand Prairie. Um, and it was the third women's shelter to open in the province of Alberta. So we knew nothing about women's shelters in 1980. And, um, the first book that identified battered woman syndrome came out of the States and it was by Walker. And the cycle of battering was identified in chapter three of the book. So we just started to get him to know that, that tie together of PTSD with battered women and rape trauma and uh, burnout in, in different fields. And then all of the material has come forward since then. In terms of working with victims of abuse, I have not seen a lot of new material until the work of um, Bruce Perry on brain development. And that is because prior to, to Bruce Perry's work, um, Jaffe out of Ontario, Peter Jaffe, had done a lot of work identifying the trauma to children exposed to domestic violence. And then uh, I think 
Bruce Perry's work has proven that we need to deal with the violence and abuse or we're gonna keep picking up pieces. And, and then the adverse childhood experience material came out. And the adverse childhood experience said that if there was abuse, physical, emotional, sexual, neglect, physical, emotional, mental illness or dysfunction within a family, incarceration within a family, a mother treated violently, so then you would have children exposed to domestic violence, substance abuse or divorce, we were going to have implications for, um, for addiction. So if you had five or more of those identified in your early childhood, you would have eight times the, the chance of addiction. Uh, it was tied to pulmonary disease, depression, illicit drug use. Uh, if you had six or more, you would be dying 20 years earlier. And this was a major study. This was 27,000 people followed. So this is saying to us, we need to either deal with early childhood trauma or we're going to be picking it up in many, many um, behaviors in the future. Uh, we'd always tie, we'd always, from the time I had entered the field in the early 70s, we'd already known about the tie between childhood sexual abuse and runaways. Marlene Rankle set up the Runaway Project in Edmonton because she was already seeing that childhood sexual abuse and runaways. Her and Klaus both worked at that organization. Um, and also suicide attempts. That has been known for years. You have a child that's been sexually abused, look at adolescent suicide attempts. So we've known a lot of this stuff for a long time. But if you look at it, uh, one of the things they're saying is adverse childhood experience. Well, what we're really truly talking about is violation and violence, but we're not using those words. We don't want to get that real, I guess. But if, if we have um, a child growing up in a home where there is they are watching their mother being treated violently, so domestic violence, we would have one check mark there for mother treated violently. We would have one check mark on abuse um, for emotional abuse of the child. Because if you're growing up in a violent home, you're being emotionally abused. We know that 40 to 60% of the time, if there is intimate partner violence, we also have child abuse, the child also being abused. So we may have a check mark of either physical or sexual abuse there or both. Uh, the neglect, we can certainly have physical neglect or emotional neglect. And, and part of that could even be from the mother being treated violently who does not have the energy to take care of those children. Um, in terms of mental illness, we know that, um, that in terms of men who batter, there is a higher percentage of psychopathic deviant and borderline personality disorder being presented if someone is violent towards their spouse. And the work of Dutton out of, uh, again, Canada documented that. Uh, if the, the violence is being picked up on and responded to, we may have one party being incarcerated for the violence because it is against the law. We know there's a high correlation with substance abuse 
and intimate partner violence. So then we might have another check mark there. And then we may have the divorce check mark as well. So if we are identifying children being exposed to domestic violence. When you start counting those check marks, you're getting too many to think that there's not going to be implications emotionally or physically for that child growing up. So that's part of the reason I really think we need to be dealing with intimate partner violence in a way that stops it or we're gonna be picking up the pieces for a long, long time. Does that make sense to people? Um, having been trained with Marlene, I have used Dabrowski's material with women in a battering relationship for 30 some years. And what I have presented to them is what I, I see in terms of, of battering relationships. When I ran the women's shelter 40 years ago, I got there and I thought, wait a minute, you know, I would make a good battered woman. You know, we, we always think of, of people as victims as being, um, something wrong with them. Well, you know, I could see myself in a relationship where I would make excuses for the other's behavior. I was a sensitive being. I had an understanding that people have had issues in their life and they can grow and change because I have grown and changed. I can understand that um, there can be overreactions and, um, and I care about people. I do not want to hurt someone else. But what if I'm with a partner that is not, does not have the same intent or emotional development as self? And that's what Marlene has taught us to teach battered women. So I do a very assertive intervention if I start picking up on controlling or abusive behavior. I say to the, the, the victim, you know, what I'm picking up on is you may be in a battering relationship. And if you are, there's some things you need to know because a battering relationship is not good. It is not helpful. It is hard to get out of. Can I go with, go through with you what is battering and then tell you some stuff about what I know about battering relationships? So I do, I do, I have never been said no to. So I, I say that to them and then I bring out my one sheet of paper, which I do the teaching from. And we go through what is going on in their relationship because people may not know that they're in a battering relationship. They think that a battering relationship is every day and bruises on the face. Well, that's, that's not the truth. There's many things that are within that battering relationship that are very dangerous. And it, it doesn't leave a bruise on the face because the person is hitting in different places. Um, so I go through the definition of battering of the person. And then I teach them Dombrowski's levels of emotional development. Because what I've seen is the victim is maybe functioning level two, level three, and the offender's functioning level one, level two. And the victim does not understand that the offender is not healthy. The victim has been told by the offender, you need therapy. You're crazy. Um, and they need to have that countered by someone who knows what they're doing with victims and offenders. 
So uh, what I'm saying to people is that if you're in a battering relationship, we know a few things. We know that he needs treatment. That battering pattern is hard to change. He needs treatment with someone who understands domestic violence, not minimize it. Um, and when I do that with people, so I'm, I'm telling them what is battering and then I'm telling them about the levels of emotional development. I'm having some real success. Um, and I'd like you to read, I'd like to read you this letter I received from, from one person I worked with. I was married to an abusive man for 21 years. I blamed myself for staying so long, for keeping my four children there too long, thinking I could fix the marriage and fix him. I felt like a failure when I couldn't and stupid for not seeing how abusive he was. I felt so much guilt for the trauma my kids experienced. And I was told that my codependency caused it all. I allowed his bad behavior, I allowed his bad behavior. I let his happiness be mine. I recently learned Dombrowski's levels of emotional health and it brought great relief. This teaching removed the onus of the abuse from my shoulders and put it on to my husband's, the abuser. I learned that I was an emotionally healthy level three person. It made total sense to me that I would do everything to make my husband happy. I wasn't broken. I wasn't codependent. I was healthy, strong, loving, and caring. And for the most part, that is what I saw when I worked with battered women. They were caring, beautiful people. The majority of them would, would take a beating to protect their children. They would, they would do their best to protect their children. It helped me to know that because my husband was level one. There was nothing I could have done to fix him or the marriage. It wasn't my fault. He needed help. I couldn't love him to be to being level three. I couldn't teach him, lead him, or pray with him to be emotionally healthy. And he needed professional help, help, which would which he would not get. I am relieved and empowered with this information. I have shared it with my family and friends. What I do when I am, I go through the definition of battering with the person. So a uh, battering is defined as a pattern of assaultive and controlling behaviors between adults in an intimate, sexual, theoretically peer, and usually cohabitating relationship. That definition comes from Ganley, 1982. And I have used that definition since 82 because it's, her definition has been too good. Uh, in terms of the person, what is crazy making is you've got, you've got the assault of behavior, and you've got the intimacy. That is crazy making. How do you put those two realities together? You have someone that you may have had a child with, which is as intimate a behavior as you can have, and then you have the violence. Uh, very hard for the, the victim to make sense of that, so they think they're crazy. Then I go into, uh, it's a one-page definition. I go through every every part of this with the with the woman so i say okay has he ever slapped you pinched you pulled your hair again i use this definition because the majority of this definition ganley put forward in 1982 this woman understood 
battering. And she wrote a book called Working with Men Who Batter, 1982. This is old material. But you can see that within that old material, under the physical, she had um, strangling. And we now know that that is just so lethal. Um, that if someone has been strangled by their partner, high risk of it going into further abuse and, and death. Uh, so I, I go through this one, one check mark at a time, because when someone is in a battering relationship, they're in denial. They have to be. They pretend it's not that bad just to function. And it's very interesting to see when you go through the definition and they see the check marks on paper um, that it helps break the denial. Does that make sense to people? So then I go to the next form. Um, one on that one. Okay. Sexual battery. Assaults on the breasts or genitals, forced to accept the batterer's infidelity, forced to accept or being exposed to pornography. Those ones in brackets we have added because Heather and I have seen too much of that, and especially with the pornography coming forward in the last 40 years. It was bad enough 40 years ago. But uh, again, that has becoming part of the bathroom for victims nowadays. Um, then forced to perform sexual activities the victims find degrading. Forced or manipulated pregnancy. Again, how do you control a woman? And uh, in battering relationships, we've seen it where, where uh, he has set up even an adoption of the ch children to keep the woman within the relationship longer. Um, and then uh, another one forced to have sex with others outside the relationship. And again, we added that one because a whole bunch of sexual exploitation starts like a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship and a vulnerable person put on the street. And I have been shocked at the people that have said yes to me when that comes back. We know that sexual battery within the relationship ups the lethality. So again, we have to know what's going on. And then the psychological battery, controlling activities, sleeping, eating, contact with friends and family. And that often starts um, slowly, uh, where I don't like your friend, Margaret. And every time Margaret comes over, the person is just horrid to them. And pretty soon Margaret Killett's coming over. And then your family are always interfering. And so the family's then isolated. Offenders isolate victims. And then they work to control their behavior. So again, I go through every part of this and um, him threatening suicide, the murder suicides, <laughs> not good. And if he has done that, that's going to up the lethality. The stuff that's written in blue ups the lethality on this paper. So, we go through every one of them, um, name calling, put downs, swearing, uh, holding the victim or others hostage. And, and now we've got all the monitoring, the stalking, stalking behavior. Again, we know that ups the lethality and the the stalking with technology now is making it worse because they're reading every text message the person gets and going through the phone and they have to know where they are all the time. And that's part of a battering relationship. 
and then using the children to uh, enforce the battering and also using the courts after they have left to uh, prove that she's crazy and take the children. Again, using everything that is important to the woman to control the relationships. And then the next one she identified, uh, Gam we identified, was destruction of property and pets. And what I find really funny is 1982, she had this in her definition of battering. And it's only been probably the last 15 years that the majority of, um, of the conferences has brought forward this in terms of domestic violence as a major issue. We've known it since 82, just like we have known that there's two times that people are most um, vulnerable when there's battering relationship, when they leave and when they're pregnant. We've known that since for 40 years. So what I teach battered women is Levels of Emotional Development by Dabrowski. And I teach it the way Marlene taught it to me. Uh, so she talks about primary integration, level one. And I teach them someone functioning level one sees the world through their own point of view. And they have no understanding that others see the world differently. The way they see the world is the way it is, and they are right. At the bottom of level one, you have your psychopath. So that would be Bundy or Hamoka or Bernardo in Canada. Um, not a healthy functioning being. If I, and, and I've worked with both victims and offenders, if we get a sex offender into PACE, functioning level one, they believe child welfare is overreacted, the police have overreacted, they wanted it, so the child wanted it too. Like we're not talking about healthy being. Um, and that is a, an offender functioning level one. If I get an offender in functioning level two, they may feel shame because they were caught. Does that make sense? Bottom of the level, they may be offending. Top of the level, they may be a victim, poor me. That's where you get passive aggressive is level two functioning. Um, level three is where we start getting health in human beings. When my daughter was 10, I went into Ashley's bedroom and she was crying. And I asked her what was wrong. And she told me that she had cheated on a math quiz, that she had looked at the answers in the back of the book. No one knew, no one caught her, and Ashley felt bad about herself. Does that make sense? And I said, Ashley, I'm so glad you feel bad. When we do things that are not right for us, we feel bad and we learn not to do them. So I had a, I had a 10 year old little girl at home feeling internal guilt. I had a 46 year old man in group that didn't think he had done anything wrong by sexually offending. And, and the, someone functioning level one as a sex offender, um, if you start looking at things like, um, they would think that other people would do the same thing as they would do, except you're just chicken. You know, they're better than you. We're not talking, we're not talking emotional health there. Um, Someone functioning level two as an offender 
may be crying and it may be poor me, who are they crying for? Is it guilt that they cannot live with themselves because they have finally looked at how they have hurt another being? Or is it uh, poor me, I've lost my family? Different, different reason for the crying. Um, Love is different for those three levels. And I explain this to, to the women. Love for level one is you love me if you give me what I want. Love for level two is about roles and rules. Of course I love you, I married you, didn't I? Roles and rules are more important than people in level two, functioning by the roles and the rules more important than people. Level three is caring about another human being. So love for level three, when you have intimate partner violence, you have the one partner that cares about the other and then can't understand, how can they say they love me and do this? Well, they're functioning at a different level. Does that make sense? When I show this to battered women, it's like a light goes off. Because, and I'm saying to them, and then he needs treatment and he needs to be able to hold level three, not touch it, hold it. Level three is about feeling and being real. And healthy people feel. You know, when you're hurt, you hurt. When you see horrible things, you don't want to, you want to stop it. So level three people are sensitive. Level one people are insensitive. And level two are confused. Uh, level three people take too much responsibility. They feel bad when it's not even their issue. Make sense? Level one People take no responsibility. So you can see how those two can fit together into such a horrible destruction pattern. And level three project their goodness on level one. They think the other is functioning the way they are and they don't understand. And that's where Dembrowski has been so helpful in working with victims and offenders. My belief is victims need to heal. Offenders need to change. There is a difference between the two. And I think often because um, in many relationships where there's addiction or battering, the woman is the victim. <laughs> and we like to blame women for everything. Women are codependent. Well, maybe they're healthy. That is what I'm teaching. Um, and maybe they need information to know that he needs treatment. And that's what I, I give very strongly. Um, so, and, and I find it effective. I work with people that have been in battering relationships who have demanded that their, their partner go into treatment and demanded they see change and understand that change is hard. And some of them are treatable and some are not. And I am saying that right from the beginning. And some are treatable and some are not. But the ones that, that receive treatment and can grow emotionally, um, that's hard work. And, and they, those individuals have changed. And, uh, okay, comments or questions? I think that's a lot of the material. I wanted you to have some understanding. Of it. Uh, stop the recording. Um.